It's George Landau, Emeritus Professor of English and Art History at Brown University. He's the founder and editor-in-chief of the Victorian Web. He's going to tell you a little bit more about that and also uh, what works and what doesn't work. And it's all based on his 25 years of experience uh, with, with it. The Victorian Web has received up to 14.5 million page views per month. And it contains more than 70,000 documents. Professor Lando so far has had an amazing career. I don't know whether you looked it up uh, on the AAC e-learning homepage, but his CV is really a dazzling description of international tasks, corporations, projects, and teaching. He received many, many grants and awards for that. He taught at the University of Chicago, Oxford, Yale, Lancaster, Southampton, Zimbabwe, Singapore, and so on. So uh, you can read more on our homepage about him. But we are so, so happy and so glad that he could make uh, time for us uh, to visit us here in Vegas. So uh, please give him a well, welcome, uh, Professor uh, George Lendo. Thanks, Thank you. That was the fastest I could do. Okay, that, uh, is this on? Great. Thank you, Thea. Uh, I've been involved in, I would call it, computer-involved learning rather than computer-assisted or based uh, since the early 1970s. And that's how I stumbled into this kind of a way of teaching and creating a website. Uh, Beth did something to my thing. Let's hope this will work. Uh, let's, that works. I'm sorry. No. She hit the thing, so we have to go back and start over again. And play. Good. Okay, what we're going to do is first we're going to look very briefly at the nature of hypertext hypermedia, and we'll see the origins of this one particular website. It's, you can follow it on your phones if you're, you're www.victorianweb.org. Uh, and we'll note its educational applications and how that relates again briefly, to its scholarly uses. And one of the things I will point out now uh, is that it has been very difficult to get this funded. Uh, I'm on, I've been on the committees, that, uh, NEH, that funds scholarly editing projects, scholarly projects, and things on the other side. For the people who are interested in education, it has too much scholarship. For the people who are interested in scholarship, it has too much education. And that's rather sad, because one of the things I'm trying to argue today is you have to bring these two together. And it makes it a lot more interesting for the teacher and much more useful and interesting for the students. Well, we'll look at various uh, pro uh, evaluation projects we've tried. Let's just get going on this right away. So just a few laws of media, because I think these impinge very importantly on our use of in all kinds of information technologies for teaching and learning. And it is people uh, involved in the field, and particularly teachers who are not very self-conscious about the use of their technology, are often aware of some of these things. First, media paradigms quickly become invisible, and they infect and they inflect our speech and relationships with one another, and we don't even realize. One thing you can, anyone knows is that uh, every information technology, from the scroll to the manuscript to the book to the computer to the we well, web, has all at one time or another been chosen to represent how the human mind really works and what people do with that. And using an old paradigm makes people very comfortable, like horseless carriage, uh, but it produces a lot of results because it puts on blinders. And one of the things that I will, I'm not going to talk about much in this talk, but that I found when I look at some other projects and shortcomings of my own, is that we tend to look at everything through the lenses and with the blinders created by that most important of technologies for us, the book. And we're dealing with something different here. Information technology doesn't begin with computers. Uh, in many of my talks, I go on and spend half the talk explaining different types of information technologies, their cultural and particularly sometimes their educational implications. Well, so writing is a technology. Books are machines. Rhetoric is a form, is a technological, al algorithmic way of thinking. And you can see writing's asynchronicity. One reason writing is great is because it allows time for careful thought. 
It also allows you to preserve information not possible in oral cultures. This is McLuhan and uh, Walter Evans, from the people from the Toronto School, and people who followed uh, this out. Uh, but as Plato uh, pointed out, writing is fixed, dead, it doesn't permit synchronous communication. The author is dead and cannot answer back. Uh, everybody thinks, therefore, they want immediacy. Uh, the example I always give is uh, not every child in college wants his parents to use Skype at 10 o'clock Sunday morning. He, doesn't, he or she doesn't want them to know who they might be in bed with or even what a mess their room is. The point is there are advantages to selective information. So immediacy is not always what we want. And of course, every information technology is always seen as a panacea. So OK, so what is hypertext, and what can we do with it? So the origins, Van, uh, Vannevar, and some people say it's Vannevar Bush, came up with the eye of hypertext, but not the name. That was Ted Nelson's, who did that when he was at Brown in the, the in mid-60s. But he didn't publish his 1930s paper, which he circulated fairly widely. Uh, until 1945, when it appeared in two versions, one in a pop one in Life magazine and the other uh, in the Atlantic Monthly. And this inspired a lot of people working uh, in the field once computing got going. So Bush's Memex, this is what uh, Paul Kahn and a graduate student working with him, uh, this is what the Memex would look like. It used microfilm. This is the world's first personal uh, you know, PC, the per first PC. Let's, this will take a little time. The typewriter sound, because really it was based on typing and preserving it in the form of microfilm. You'll be interested to know that everybody, HGLs and on, said that Everything we have heard about the internet is democratizing and for education, they said about microfilm in the 1930s. The owner of the Memex, let us say, is interested in the properties of the bow and arrow. He has dozens of possibly pertinent books and articles in his Memex. First he runs through an encyclopedia, finds an interesting but sketchy article, and leaves it projected. Next, in a history, he finds another pertinent item and ties the two together. Thus he goes, building a trail of many items. Occasionally, he inserts a comment of his own, either linking it into the main trail or joining it by a side trail to a particular item. His trails do not fade. Several years later, his talk with a friend turns to the Turkish bow. In fact, he has a trail on it. It is an interesting trail, pertinent to the discussion. So he sets a reproducer in action, photographs the whole trail out, and passes it to his friend for insertion in his own mimics. several things about this. The original idea was that people would have libraries of information, databases, text bases, image bases, and they would have a machine that would allow them to capture what Engelbart, a very important engineer, he was head of the US science, uh, basically in the United States during uh, World War II, ultimately in charge of the development of uh, the two, two most important things, perhaps his projects, the synthesis, uh, synthesis of penicillin and, and the atomic bomb. He was an engineer looking for solutions to what he saw was an information explosion and that people are swamped by information. 
Notice that his idea of communication would be that you would be able to make chains of links and showed people how you thought about things you had discovered and they may have already known about or not, and then you would share these paths that could go off in different directions, and you could add to them. Well, some of the first hypertext systems actually achieved this quite, uh, quite nicely. The problem being that when HTML was invented, it sort of killed approximately 20 years of computer science development and work. So we're left with a very small part of the original project. So uh, everybody originally thought that if it was hypertext, you had to be able to write as well as to read. And this is one of the reasons that the first papers on the World Wide Web were not accepted at the hypertext, the computer science hypertext conferences, because they said this is really primitive and going backwards. Um, and so both they are extremely right and they're extremely wrong. Well, let's look. These are, these are different systems. These are also, it turns out, in this case, a precursor to the Victorian web. This is, uh, this is an entire poem, Tennyson's Victorian web, which is, uh, I'm sorry, Tennyson's In Memoriam, which has its place in earlier versions of the Victorian web because it is the complete instantiation, the exemplification of hypertext and hypertext linking. And in courses on hypertext poetry or hypertext fiction that I teach in the Creative Writing School uh, at Brown, this would be one of the exemplary works they would read. This rather apparently old-fashioned, but it turns out it's really the source of Leaves of Grass and uh, The Wasteland and many, many another work. The interesting thing about this, as you'll see, I don't have a laser pointer, but if you look on the left, what this had, unlike the World Wide Web, it would tell you where you were all the links coming in to where your present document and all the links going out of it. So there was never any problem about the reader, the students in this case, getting lost. And students could add their own annotations and then share them with other people. This is in a system called StorySpace. It's still available, but it is a standalone system. So if you want to share it, you have to be able to uh, either pass it around on thumb drives or put it on a server which then students download. This is the precursor, the original intermedia. This, as you'll see, is from about 1990. Uh, and this was from my, po I had three websites. I've given this one away because it's too much to run. The Postcolonial Literature and Culture site. And this was about Nigeria and Nigerian authors. Uh, one of the things that is clear how this is different from the web as we know it is what you have are multiple windows and the ability to save windows in a position, but far more important is that thing at the right, which is in computer science terms called the global tracking map uh, and what was called, we call the web view. Every time you opened a document, you would have not only the history above it, but it would tell you every document that this was linked to. And this had something which the web still doesn't have and it's, as mine con concerned, its greatest weakness, it would have one-to-many linking, which means when you made a link, the system would automatically allow you to put in a descriptor so people could click on something and a beginner could read an introduction, a more advanced person could go to something else, and so on. But what this had in addition was when, the, when you clicked on a link, this would be the role and status of women in Nigeria, you would get these, uh, four, it turned out that the five of these things were available in that link, so you had a preview you could go to. So, now let's look at the Victorian web. And as of um, yesterday, it has about 73,000 documents. I think we're about 10 documents short. And so what I'm going to do now is quit out of this and go to the Victorian web and then come back to this in a while. It doesn't look like most, uh, uh, most websites, nor is it intended to. Uh, it's, the idea here is that all of these different concept areas, these actually intellectual domains or disciplines surround the main idea of what is Victorianism. Um, and recently we put in the, uh, the introduction explaining what it is, and you can read this at your leisure, 
But the main thing I want to emphasize is all the scholarly development is going now towards creating archives or text or image bases. Essentially, they take and they put things like Project Gutenberg, which I love, or the Internet Archive, or the Hathity, the Hathity Digital Library Trust, and they recreate the book in digital form and leave it there. Sometimes uh, they leave it in very bad shape. That is, the uh, very primitive OCR scans uh, are unusable, and you want to use them, you have to do it yourself. But the point is, everything is in a silo. The whole basic idea that people thought of that what is important about the internet will be its hypertextual qualities, that everything has connections, that the world is a network of very complex connections, all this is actually being lost. And so we have to find ways of recapturing it. And we can look at the credits. There is also the University of Computenza uh, in Madrid, the city of Madrid, uh, funded a translation of this with about 100 volunteers. And so the, the, um, you can get to that version of the site. There's a much smaller uh, uh, French site uh, as well. Now, let's just look at some of the things that are in it. Well, you could go to Victoria and Victorians, and you can find all about Queen Victoria. And every this, you can get to one of these overviews or site maps. You can, these are each of the homes that she lived in. And each of these is a fairly substantial uh, essay, both, and you will see, you often with really substantial bibliographies. So these are things that are available, whoever wants to use them. Uh, we could also, in this, look at, for example, an introduction to Victorian and Victorianism. Or we could look at, so I'm being very showing ones of mine, sorry, movements and currents in 19th century thought, but other, and one of the things about this, which is a rather different from the Wikipedia idea, is that there are multiple points of view. This is not just a trot where you get one idea. In fact, one of the most interesting things we can use when we get to this for students is have them find evidence and argue on different sides of a, of a point. Uh, what else? Let's go through this quickly. Uh, well, we'll look at the... I should explain several things. Uh, we'll look at this done by Marjorie Bloy, a PhD uh, senior researcher at the University of Singapore. Uh, this was funded, the development of the materials, originally as part of a computer science project the development of Intermedia. Uh, it was housed at Brown, but funded externally, and Brown has never supported any of the work that you see. Uh, when I went, was invited to come to Singapore to found an honors program to create creativity and innovation, uh, they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on uh, hiring postdocs, senior researchers, who would create work that we had the copyright on. So this is as a way of getting us started. And Margie Bloy uh, was one of those people. But you could learn about the Chartism and the Chartist movement. Each one of those are essays or you know, working class atheism, the British Empire, or lots of things on 19th century riots and civil disorders. Uh, there's, and I'm not going to go into this, but there's an enormous amount of material. The education system is quite large. What life was like in English public schools, the earliest ragged schools, Jewish education, orf and a whole series of things on the history of the orphanage, uh, starting with Captain Coram and his famous foundling hospital, which was, and as you can see, uh, we have different formats for different types of scholarly uh, works. Well, we, I have a batch of editors, uh, all of whom have doctorates, all of whom are, um, have published multiple books. Um, well, on the genre, I'm not going to go through all of these. We have break it down into fiction. Uh, for authors, I'm going to show you one. This originally started as a support for a literature course, uh, but I would say the visual arts are probably, you know, have more of it. Let's go to Carlisle, and we could look at Carlisle and political history. We could look at uh, Carlisle and religion. But we're going to look at one of the works, Signs of the Times, and he is someone who'd argued that all kinds of uh, education 
in his own time or actually forms of technology. He was one of the first person people to understand that technologies are, do not always involve uh, iron and uh, steel. And one of the assignments, I guess, we'll come back to this later. So one of the assignments I gave students, because this is really hard for anybody to read, is we assembled a list of words or references and had told students they had to pick two, and then they could, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, they had to go out on their own. They had to use both digital and other. This is a one-week one assignment. Uh, they had to define it. Then they had to show what Carlisle used in it. And one of the interesting things here you will see is that they, uh, this person cited work by another student as well as scholarly work. Well, that is the first tantalizing showing of how in this scholarly site we're using it for education. And one of the th purposes today will be to show you what happened when we tried to survey how students were actually using it, what they were using as sources of information, and uh, so on. So then we have many minor authors, uh, Eliza Lynn Linton, uh, Letitia Barbo, a lot of people that's not known except to uh, scholars. And, but then we, we have multimedia things as well. We could go to the music hall and let's take, uh, the, where's the houses in between? Here we go. Enough of that. That was a song, and he sings in every regional and class accent. This is Derek Scott, our uh, uh, editor uh, for music. He is, I believe, one of the world's experts in English and American popular music. He has something like three dozen performances. Uh, these things are very important for gender studies, social history, uh, and, and the like. Okay, and but it's not all. Uh, one of the things that it is richest in is the history of, of science, and we have a, a large number of French and English primary texts, and then re resources online. And let's just go to the bottom of this, and well, let's go back to here. One of the things we have are Victorian web books. These are scholarly books in social history, art history, history of religion, uh, and so on. Lots and lots of them. Uh, and we also have uh, dozens and dozens of serious scholarly reviews of books. So let's, we're finished right now with the Victorian web. And let's go back to here. Okay, there are also things I didn't bother to show you. Uh, sculpture which you can revolve, uh, the viewer can revolve so that you can see things that you can't actually see if you went to a museum. So here's the chronology of it. The intermediate system designed in uh, 1987, I was fortunate because of my earlier work in teaching graduate students how to use uh, mainframe computing uh, for editing, not that I wanted to turn them into scholarly editors, I wanted to uh, teach them firsthand how 
the texts that they use are sort of social constructions in which people have argued about whether we should take this thing from the manuscript and make it a comma or a, uh, a dash, and I would give them, each of them, uh, five different letters that were unpublished, so they couldn't go anywhere to look them up. And then they would edit them and then come in, and then I would stand back, and they'd have an editorial meeting, and within 15 minutes, people were screaming and banging there on the desk, you can't change this, this would be dishonest, or you have to. And they realize every book that they use has been created this way, with interference from editors and the rest. So that's why I call it computer involved, because you couldn't do this uh, manually. It would take, uh, I would say, 10 to 20 times as long. Then the intermediate system was de designed. I was part of the d design group. They asked me what I wanted, what I would need to teach with. So some of these are my guesses. Uh, we had about 500 documents in 1988. The first intermediate use was a year later. The, uh, the, um, what are now called PCs, then called engineering workstations, arrived from IBM a year late. So we had two years to develop. So the Dickens Web was published in uh, uh, 1990. Uh, did I go too fast? Yeah. Uh, then finally, uh, they were ported. Uh, there's a second version of Intermedia. They were then ported uh, to other computer uh, environments. In 1993, uh, one of my undergraduate assistants, uh, having been, uh, I had showed him on the high energy physics site at Brown, the first one at Brown, that they had uh, so this thing called the World Wide Web. And so as an English major, he said, well, there's, I, if someone gave me this manual of Unix, I'll learn it and I'll, I'll just create stuff. There were no editors or anything, and he did it. And then we decided to move the whole thing to the World Wide Web. Um, for a, up until about 1994, the sites were housed uh, at what was called the Scholarly Technology Group uh, server at Brown, and uh, it received more hits than any of the other Brown websites, the official university websites. So we asked them would they like to, you know, us to put Brown University on each thing, and they said, well, that's not our policy to do web stuff. So a, f a few years later, my son, who's in this computer business, said, uh, why don't you move it outside of Brown? Because every place I go, they say, you're so lucky to be at Brown where they fund this. And I'll say, well, Brown doesn't fund it at all. So he said, well, let's do it. When we went to Singapore, they were very willing to do this. Then we had various people join, uh, editors in Poland and several, in a th uh, three in England uh, and two in America, one in Canada. Uh, so what are the advantages of educational hypermedia? Well, you can teach traditional necessary academic skills. You can reconfigure, reconfigure the place and space of learning, provide information on demand. This is all old hat. You can encourage sophisticated multi-causal feeling, uh, feeling thinking and feeling. You can create multiple contexts. That's sort of repetitive, but true. Create collaborative work, learning, and writing environments. You can enable multidisciplinary thinking and create community or course memory. You can share resources. And you can see all the other kinds of things. Most of the talks that I give when I've, uh, about the relation of this uh, subject to learning are really about creating new forms of thinking and writing, and it's sort of like creating postmodern and uh, you know, post-print ways of thinking and writing, as opposed to the kind of academic uh, teaching that I'm, I'm doing here. And I, we're going to have a session afterwards, and I could either show people some of these things or show them how to find that. So what are forms of collaboration that my students have ended up with? It's unplanned. Because when you have a large website, you have asynchronous contributions. Someone can co contribute something. Someone else will write something on the same subject. And the editor makes a link. Sometimes they say, please put a link in here. So it can be planned by a group of students working together. And I've had done experiments uh, in which, of course, I've been teaching on uh, um, new journalism and uh, Anglo-American nonfiction, modern nonfiction. Uh, I did a little quick introduction on hypermedia and then had students create group projects that were hypertextual without them knowing how to do anything about the web. And then several people actually decided they wanted to write a hypermedia autobiography. And uh, 
or um, version of a, a long-form journalism. Then another form of this is one author modifies an earlier author's contribution. The example I use, I'm not sure if I have it here, I'll just mention it. Someone, uh, one of my original research assistants, graduate student, now is a full professor at a university, uh, wrote something on Arminianism in, for our very large religion in England site, uh, part of the site. And someone from South Africa wrote in a decade later and said, this is inadequate. Why don't, and the other guy said, yeah, why don't we add what he said? And so it now has both their names. And the second author wrote in is now the first author. Also, sometimes people take intentionally opposing positions. Okay. So we've done the Victorian web demo, so we don't need that. So here is a class assignment that I used. This appears on the syllabus. This is in classes for about 35 people. Uh, weekly discussion questions. The course relies heavily on student-centered discussion generated by the weekly writing assignments. These reading and discussion questions have several required parts. First, now the reason for this is I find students, whether from freshmen to outstanding graduate students and second level graduate seminars, have great difficulty, as we all do, in moving from our idea to our data or moving from our data to our idea. So the first part of it is choose a substantial passage of one to three paragraphs or stanzas, if it's a poem, when discussing a text, and in different directions if it's an image. Create a graceful and effective introduction to the material you choose that suggests why the reader should want to follow you as you examine it closely. In other words, you can never say Hemingway states, colon. That's a way of saying, OK, I don't know what to say next. Reader, you do the work for me. What I'm interested in is the power of writing in which the, uh, the student author convinces the reader that they want to follow what the student author is saying. Then follow the quoted passage with at least one paragraph of commentary. It could be very brief. And then ask four or five questions about the works. And you don't have to have the answers but they can't be things like, do you like this? It has to be, one would be about theme, one about context, and so on. And then provide a title for your question set. These question sets evolved over 15, 20 years. I first forgot that, that if you don't have a title, you know, it's, if we put this up on the web, I don't know what to call it. And I realized the title is a really important thing for a student writing an essay. It tells, it gives them a chance to point you in the direction. So how, the question was, how much do the students actually have to know about the media in which they learn? Well, they s send the materials in to me, and I'll tell you how we did this. Uh, since we weren't using a wiki, I would say, do all this. At the beginning of every paragraph, you put a, a, par a carrot, a P, another carrot, and you do the slash one at the end, and you put in the, the next week, I tell them how to do italics. Then the third week, I tell them how to do the things for a long quote. Uh, and that's all they have to know how to do. And by the end of the third or fourth week, they know how to make a website and how to link between things. Uh, we don't spend much time on this unless the student comes in and wants to talk about it. But their stuff goes up. More than that, their stuff has two things that I do not find on course websites, which is why I often give a talk, don't use a course website. One, it's public. You cannot believe the number of students when they, when they say, oh, this is online. And I say, but you've got an A in this. And he said, I'm going to go back and rewrite it because someone else is seeing it. We all know in writing, students believe that you are kind of a robot and you don't have a real existence outside the classroom. But when it's on a person who could, outside who could read it, okay, also this stays online. I've had very, very few people ask later to take it down. And it's not been these kinds of productions. It's been in the creative writing courses. And it's almost always Asian women who write about the relationship with their mothers. And about five years later say, my mother just found this. Please take it down. And I say, we can't take it down because it's already on Google. We'll give you, choose a pseudonym, and we'll do that. And that's about the best we, we can do. Uh, so obviously. That's something a lot of students don't know at the beginning, but they're getting the idea that this is a public media that we're looking at. And this is, so they're born with computers and all the rest of this, apparently. But do they actually understand? Uh, of course, they don't understand older media. 
You know, it's ticking like clockwork, what's cl clockwork? Another perfectly good saying, bites the dust. Or Mr. Wilson says, I sound like a broken record. What's a record? Goes on with these kinds of things. How did you carry it? Well, you don't carry it, it sat there all the same. But where are the buttons? It's got a dial. Well, how does this little piece of paper show you who you're calling? It didn't uh, the number show the number. Then how it, then it wasn't a real phone? Uh, well, it was. Well, it is. Well, this is what we, apparently, if they know this much, they must know about computers. And of course, some of them, as Jeremy tells us from Zitz, feels very uncomfortable around analog machines. Well, let's take this. Min Lu, a 21-year-old liberal arts student from the, this is from of the New York Times at the New School, got a Facebook account at 17, and she put everything on, pictures of her in cocktail dresses, holding drinks. And then, concerned about her career prospects, she asked her friend to take down a photograph of her drinking and wearing a tight dress. When the women overseeing her internship asked to join her Facebook circle, she agreed, but she cut off a lot of it. The conventional wisdom suggests that everyone under 30 is comfortable revealing every facet of their lives online, from their favorite pizza to the most frequent sexual partners, but many members of the tell-all generations are rethinking what it means to live out loud. That's Laura Hobson's beginning of her article. So some young adults, teenagers, whether texting or sexting, do not, in, in general, seem to have made the same crucial recognition. They have become more cautious, more practical, perhaps uh, like the, the older, they have not, you know, like, they haven't become like us. So, but have the people like uh, Min Lu, have they begun to understand the fundamental qualities of networked uh, electronic media? When writing moves, and this is something in other lectures I spend a very long time on, when it moves from its age-old dependence upon physical marks on physical surfaces to code stacked on codes, very important things change, and I'll just mention two. We can, digital text can be duplicated exactly, which means both the distortions created by scribal drift in the old telephone, you know, game of telephone, they don't occur. That's wonderful if you want to duplicate an engineering manual, a law uh, uh, code, or work of literature. It's not so wonderful if you wish to uh, deny that you said that. In addition, digital uh, text, text and images on the internet can be duplicated at virtually no cost. Again, wonderful if you wish to share any sort of information, not so wonderful if you don't intend that image to circulate widely and often more important to remain online. So most uses of new media take the form of projecting the assumptions of print on the digital, the hard media upon the soft. Instances of this horseless carriage syndrome pervade the academic and scholarly world. And I've talked about course-based websites, so I won't mention it here. So, you, we know students rely on Wikipedia, YouTube. They may have developed certain intellectual and computer skills, to be sure, but they may not know how to make educational use of hypertext. So, briefly, how much time? Ten minutes, good. The link versus the search tool. In the early days of hypertext, the first hypertext conference was in 1987. The big battle was between information retrieval on the one hand and the link on the other. When the web came out, it looked like hypertext had won, and then Google came along, and it, it were pretty much information retrieval, searching had come. So we'll see what the effects is. So I gave, the, so you've heard the assignment I gave. Then we get a survey. We just, after the survey, I then explained to students about the nature of hypermedia, what use the Victorian web would be, did another assignment, and did a second survey. Okay. And you have already seen Thomas Carlyle's essay, Signs of the Times, and you've, the, the assignment, this just uh, sets it forth. You have to make an annotation. This is what you have to do. And again, note that the text that they are working with appeared in the Victorian web, and the Victorian web contains a search tool. So, okay. Despite repeated urgings by instructors, you know, orally, to consult the university library's reference librarian, a specialist trained in research methods, only one out of 25 students did so for the annotation assignment, though incidentally 14 did so for the final assignment. Examining the annotation assignments made clear most students tended to go straight to Wikipedia or Google. Now, we discussed it, I examined it, and of the 22 students who answered this particular question, 12 went first to Google, eight to the Victorian web, one to Wikipedia, and one to a classmate. 
after that, the second source of information they consulted, the Victorian Web 13, so that means 21 out of the 22 students use the Victorian Web now for their first or second choice of information. I mean, it was kind of crazy going to Google when often they had something that was exactly what they might need to fill out part of the question. And it goes on. Uh, all but one or two students reported that they use the Victorian Web and Search tool frequently. 18 reported they usually follow links and text they read on the site, six doing only sometimes. More interestingly, 15 claim to follow two or three links in a row. This is very interesting because most people, when we've surveyed them, they go to Google, they go in, and they come out. It's like information is all separate. There's no connection. There's no intellectual connection made for them. They can find information, but no one helps them do anything with it and no one has told them how to make connections going back to Vannevar Bush. That's the educational effect of hypermedia. Then on the eight reported, they followed six or more links. And on the students, uh, this was interesting because when we first, before Google, way back in the 1980s and early 90s, when we were using intermedia, we found that students would follow links 10 or 15 times because on purpose we did not give them a version of Intermedia that had a search tool. There was one that had an excellent search tool. We didn't use that in the classroom. And students actually read in a very sophisticated way. Uh, and it's interesting to note that this has disappeared on the web. That's an empty thing for this. Okay. So the evidence of the questionnaire suggests, I propose, that if we want to have students take advantage of new technologies, we have to understand the technologies, decide what we want to achieve with those technologies, and then tell that to the students repeatedly. Okay, well, what about wikis? Now, a wiki seems to be, thank God, that it's now this is known as uh, Web 2.0. Uh, when I gave the opening lecture at the computer science ACM, wiki conference in Portugal, uh, I started off with web 2.0 is hypertext 0.5, because it still hasn't gotten there all the way. But it's an enormous leap forward. Wikis are a read-write form. They are also web-based, so many people can use them. Like other forms of hypertext, they can, again, emphasize intended and unintended collaboration, multiple points of view, expandable, extendable documents. They're always changing. They're open or soft ordered. So, so there are many different genres of hypertext. I want to emphasize that Wikipedia is not the paradigmatic uh, kind of a wiki, because Wikipedia gives the appearance of an encyclopedia that there is one real true answer that everybody agrees on. And we know that any subject, such as the ones we're studying here, when it's still alive for discussion, everybody disagrees. There is no one paradigm. But wikis are used for, and I didn't realize this until I went to this conference, is that, it, for example, there's one great, great example. The people from Bowie who built the 747 were all retiring, and all of their shared knowledge was being lost. So they had a closed wiki, and everybody would put up what they knew so that new people would know that they, they would create community memory. I would say, that what we should use instead of course-based, we should use course-based wikis and expand them to make the course and the wiki last forever. And not only that, make sure that more than one faculty member was involved. So, okay, the second experiment was, when I gave this at this ACM conference, the question they said is, okay, the Victorian web you're saying is like a moderated wiki, which most of you will have understood. Why don't you actually try a wiki? So I had uh, the, the, the people at the learning community would do this for you. They created a wiki. And so the students would do the same type of question sets and put them on the wiki as opposed to earlier years. So you would have expected that the users of the wiki would place far more emphasis on text written by members of their own class than did the earlier, the previous year. And in fact, approximately 50% of the students in both years read the work by members of their class each week, and 50% only did so once or twice. And this is perhaps surprising. The percentage of those each year who followed links to the Victorian web and read work by students in previous classes also divided the same way, 50% and 50%. Well, uh, since I gather I only have a few more uh, minutes, I'm just going to stop here and get that underlined. People did not transfer their more hypertextual approach of using the website to the wiki 
nor the models of using the wiki did not affect how they used the Victorian web. So this means if you're going to use the wiki, you are going to either have to connect it up to a text base that is of some use to you, but you uh, and you are also going to have to emphasize how you want it worked. And of course, one of the uh, disadvantages, it's great for instructors. You don't have to edit anything. It's secret. No one else outside Brown sees it. In fact, no one outside your class sees it. But their writing improves very, very little in comparison. And an anonymous reader of the, because this was a, a, a uh, a paper, the researcher was shown at a, a paper uh, in uh, uh, the last place Hypertext was in Europe, uh, in Eindhoven. Uh, an anonymous reader said, given the higher quality of student work was extracted from the wiki reformatted, placed on the Victorian web, could such procedure have created an impression of the wiki as a separate scratch pad? And the answer is no, because we emphasized their writing on the wiki. It was only the very best students work with their permission, we would then make public. Otherwise, it stayed private. So these, one of the uses, I mean, one of the conclusions I want to give uh, here is that educational technology is something you use because you have a particular reason to use it, not because it's cool, not because you can get a special grant and some time off to do it, because I will guarantee you will spend far more time and money developing that than you will ever get any release out of that. But it's of enormous value, and it's going to be the new way of teaching. And I thank you for listening on my experiments, which what worked and what didn't. Thank you. <laughs>